Well, it's the holiday season, so go ahead and hop onto my lap and tell Asian Santa what you want for Christmas. What's that? You want the gift of knowledge? Okay, well, let me tell you about Onmyoji and their magical rituals. Onmyoji were wizards who practiced the magical art of yin and yang, and their golden age was in the Heian period of Japan. People thought they could do all kinds of magic, like reading your fortune, driving out demons and evil spirits, and even turning little paper dolls into their servants. Now we know today that magic isn't real, magicians are liars, Magic the Gathering is just arguing with paper, and Disneyland's Magic Kingdom runs on the manipulation of children through marketing. The only real magic is the magic that comes from a sip of boba tea. But to the Heian Japanese, magic was real, and Onmyoji wielded it. Onmyoji were part of the government. They were public servants, kind of like a mailman, but instead of bringing you mail, he brought you magical protection. But Onmyoji also sold their services, so kind of like a mailman that you paid every time he brought you the mail. People also wrote to Onmyoji asking for advice, so like a mailman that you paid, but you could also call him up specifically for suggestions on how to write letters. At this point, I'm going to skedaddle from this analogy like I do with all my problems that snowball out of control. Two clans specialized in churning out Onmyoji, the Abe and the Kamo. For the magical art of yin and yang, these two clans were like the Coke and Pepsi of their time, the Tesla and Edison, the Windows and Windows 7. So like with the doctor, if someone didn't like the advice of one clan, they went to the other clan to get a second opinion. The two top Onmyoji in the Heian period were Kamo no Yasunori and his student Abe no Seime. Abe no Seime is the name that every Onmyoji enthusiast knows of and will instigate a civil rights protest in the comment section if you don't mention him in your YouTube video. There was also Abe Lincoln, who also wore a tall hat and fought supernatural creatures. So how did one become an Onmyoji? Well, you had to go learn from the Onmyoji masters. They took in a limited number of students, chosen from among the nobility class, probably through the typical Heian methods of nepotism and dirty politics. These smooth-cheeked students spent time at Onmyoji Hogwartsu, learning all about the tools of the trade and the magical art of yin and yang. After some time, after growing some hair on their asses, they became fully working Onmyoji. They were mostly employed by the upper class in the capital. Now you may think that only a few people wanted their services, like the number of people today who go to fortune tellers to lose money. But no, Onmyoji were super busy. People were like hypochondriacs, but for spiritual health. If a Heian noble had something weird happen to him, he called an Onmyoji to ask what it meant. They kept sending messages to Onmyoji, asking for advice about the smallest things, like where to plant a tree to best protect from evil spirits. Heian nobles paid Onmyoji to do all kinds of tasks. These are fun to talk about because people believe things that you've never even thought of. It really puts you into the superstitious mindset of the Heian Japanese. One of the most important things Onmyoji did was to pick the best locations for buildings based on how much spiritual protection the location had. For example, when someone wanted to build a house, he'd call up an Onmyoji to ask where he should put the house. Seems simple, right? Wrong, you stupid shoe. Let me tell you about the four guardians. The idea originally came from China. Each of the four cardinal directions is associated with a mythical beast, a guardian. Seiryu to the east, Suzaku to the south, Byako to the west, and Genbu to the north. Each guardian is also associated with a geographical feature. Seiryu is represented by running water, Suzaku still water, Byako a road, and Genbu high ground. So the ideal spot for a building was one that was right in the middle of these four things. That way the building is protected on all sides by the guardians. People took this idea very seriously. People would send urgent letters to their Anmyoji asking really specific things like, Hey, I'm about to buy a house. Should the river next to it be flowing west to east or north to south? And Anmyoji would tell people things like, Hey, build a pond here on the south side. Or plant some trees on the north side because that's kind of like high ground. Also, ready to have your mind blown into a dirty tissue, the Heian capital, which would later be called Kyoto, happened to sit right in the middle of these four features. The Kamal River to the east, Oguraike Pond to the south, the San Indo Road to the west, and Mount Funaoka to the north. Unfortunately, Oguraike Pond no longer exists, so Kyoto is currently vulnerable to the south. Come on, North Korea, show us what you got. 
But to be honest, they probably did not choose the capital location because of this. It was the reverse. The idea became popular after the capital was already built. They saw the four geographical features that surrounded them and attached those symbols of running water, still water, road, and high ground to the four guardians. Another thing on Miyagi did was drive out evil spirits from abandoned homes. People believed a home left empty for a long time collected evil spirits, demons, and generally bad things. Like if they saw someone lurking in an empty house, they would think it was a demon or even a fox in disguise. So before moving to an empty home, they called an onmyoji over to perform a ritual to exorcise these squatter ghosts. This is usually a henbai ritual. It involved chanting a spell and stepping on the ground in a pattern and maybe doing some hand movements. One foot pattern went like this. Left foot, right left. Right foot, left right. Left foot, right left. Now it sounds silly, but when you see it in real life, it looks silly too. This ritual was originally used before going into danger, before a perilous journey, or before going to war. But by the mid Heian period, these orange juice drinking pansy nobles used it when they moved into an empty home, because empty homes were that scary. The Henbai ritual was a specialty of the famous Abe no Seime. One of the funnest customs that came out of yin yang beliefs was the idea of unlucky directions. They believed that there were certain violent gods that moved around a lot, traveling from one compass direction to another. If you move in the direction of one of these gods, it would be unlucky, and not just a vague, uncertain bad luck like, oh no, you broke a mirror, who knows what could happen. No, your family members could die in some cases. We ain't playing around, kid. For example, if you spent the nights at your mistress's house and wanted to go back home to the west, but it just so happened that for a few days a god resided in the west, you wouldn't be able to go west. You'd go southwest and crash at a friend's place for the night, then go northwest back home the next day to get a beating from your wife. Where a god resided depended on the year, the season, the month, and a million different things. So a god could stay in the west for one day, then move to the northwest and stick around for a few days, then hang around north for a few more. Sometimes a god would go crazy and stay in one direction for a freaking year or more. But even people back then realized that it would have been ridiculous not to go west for a year. In that case, you only had to avoid the taboo direction on certain days. So yeah, it got complicated. Who knows what would have happened without Onmyoji there to calculate the gods' movements. Disaster, that's what. Onmyoji liked to play with little dolls, but these weren't the Barbie dolls you used to play with when you were a kid and tried to hide because dolls were for girls. No, these were magical and had more realistic proportions. One type of doll was made of paper, wood, grass, leaves, or straw. It was cut into kind of human form, maybe a mecha form. To purify someone, an onmyoji would rub the doll on the person's body, then cast it into a river or something, getting rid of the spiritual pollution. An onmyoji could write a person's name on it and curse or hurt someone by poking holes in it or ripping off a part of it. Or an onmyoji could take two dolls, each with a name, and pray for two people to fall in love. Onmyoji can imbue another type of doll with a spirit, making it his servant. The possibilities were endless. The onmyoji's main duty was to offer the emperor and the state protection, magical rubbers for the country. They interpreted omens. When an accident or something strange happened in a public building, a temple, or a shrine, they asked an Amiyaji to investigate and figure out what it meant and if they needed to perform some ritual. They did a lot of purification rituals to cleanse curses and calm vengeful ghosts. Such rituals can be huge. In one case, after the capital was moved, a purification ritual commenced that had 2,000 people chanting and 2,700 lit lamps. During the new year, Onmyoji went around town purifying harmful energies and particularly negative areas to ensure the new year started clean. Because when a year starts great, it stays great. Onmyoji led three yearly state ceremonies. One to protect the capital against spirits, one to protect it against fires, and one to protect it against diseases. Disease defense was a biggie. As Japan grew and built roads, more people moving around meant epidemics spread like jealousy in a group of close teenage girlfriends. Disease outbreaks rampaged across the country, leading to famines because farmers died off. The numerous droughts didn't help either. The devil traveled the country, dual-wielding sickness and starvation. 
Bodies literally piled up by roadsides and floated down rivers, so the roads and rivers, the means of transportation critical to the states and the economy, became sources of spiritual contamination. People thought ghosts and evil spirits haunted the roads and rivers. Amiyaji were often seen performing roadside rituals to drive away the dead and cleanse the ground, especially along paths of disease spread. Despite the common belief that Japanese did not do animal sacrifices, these rituals did include sacrificing animals, especially horses and cattle, and may have been considered the best way to stop epidemics. The court did try to stop animal sacrifice and blood offerings by passing edicts saying, stop that. Killing animals wasn't a very Buddhist thing to do, but people just kept doing it. All in all, as you can see, Amiyoji were a critical part of daily life for the elites in the Heian period. For more on Amiyoji and their origins, check out this video. I'd like to thank the new patrons this week, Nika, Liz Bonanza, and Savannah Bonanza. Savannah actually signed up on Patreon for her mom, Liz, as a Christmas present. So I'm gonna cry now. Alright you guys, I love you and spread the knowledge.